the human animal isn't doing well in the modern world. We have become domesticated and have lost our wildness. Rates of unhappiness are skyrocketing. We are anxious, fragmented, and drowning in an overwhelming sense of meaninglessness. It should be clear to all of us that for all the promises of modernity, we don't seem to be better off when it comes to our overall health. The Human Animal Show explores a return to a state of wild health, our original, authentic human animal. And now for your hosts, Frank Forensich and Dr. Rodney King. Tyson. Hey. Can you hear me? That's me. That's yeah. me. How are you doing, sir? Yeah, very well. Thank you. Well, <laughs> you are an incredibly hard person to pin down. <laughs> <laughs> well, you did it. And, you know, uh, thanks for making the effort with the unreasonable hour that you're uh, uh, you that know what I mean? About it, man. I mean, it's 4 a.m. for me, but I'm so excited to chat to you. I should have my co-host Frank here at some point, unless we got all the time conversions right. wrong, because he's on the other side of the world. He's in Seattle, Washington. So okay, all they, right. They, they, it doesn't really matter at the end of the day. I'm I'm good to go. Um, yeah, and we'll just go with it. I mean, are you keen to just kind of jump into this? Yeah, definitely. Just jump in, and we'll see where it takes us. Look, um, yeah, and I know how you feel. I I had. <laughs> I have a lot of early AM things too. Uh, I'm sure. I've I'm sure. recently started saying no because it's just, yeah, it's too much. I had one last week was like 2 a.m. And I went in and it was the wrong day. So I got up and decided to do it two nights in a running at yeah, 2 a.m. Yeah. I think that's what's yeah. happened. I think that's what's happened to my co host, Frank, right? He's like, because right. we got, he's probably got it all m- messed up, but it doesn't matter. I yeah. mean, the, the point yeah. is, I'm, I'm speaking to you. That's what matters to me. I've been wanting to talk to you for a good while. I really enjoyed your book. Um, made me think of a lot of things. I'm, yeah. I'm on a path right now, moving in a direction that we can talk about, where I'm really trying to discover a more simpler way to live. I think many people are. Mm. Part of my realization is, it's not that I didn't realize it, but it's become more front and center in my experience mm. is that the problem really is the system that we all find ourselves in and the modern system and the way that it's set up. I'm not surprised as I look around that so many people are struggling, suffering. If we just look at you know the reports on mental health, that's definitely something that has gone completely in the wrong direction, right? A lot of people are struggling. There's a sense of loss of meaning. And all of these things, I think, are encompassed in this living in the modern world in the machine. In some sense, the way that I feel, right, it's like that um, that saying, you know, does a fish know that it's in water? Mm. And uh, I guess that's where I want to pick your brain. Kind of my starting question would be for you is, what do you feel from your perspective is the biggest problem that we're facing right now? As a, I like to refer to us as the human animals, right? So that we are an animal and we've forgotten that. But as human animals, what do you think is the biggest kind of problem that we're facing collectively? Mm. Uh, I sort of, I don't know. Uh Loss of a sense of humor is a is a good starting point. I don't sure. Know. Um, like yeah, particularly, I don't know. We 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 should be able to have a bit of a bit of fun in these yarns. We should be able to. Uh, I don't know. We're, we're in such a outlandish predicament. Um, you know, as a as a species, a custodial species of of the world. Um. No, I think I think laughter is an acceptable response. 
it's not your only response, but it is, you know, it's natural to have a bit of a laugh when things get, you know, horrendously bad. <laughs> yeah. So what what um, do you what do you think is like my take on the fact that, you know, like here's an example. What I notice is if you look at most of the self-help genre that's out there as an example, and yeah, most of the yeah. kind of psychological protocols that are put out there to supposedly help us live a more flourished life. If you look mm. very closely at these, what you notice is really that they are actually embedded within the problem itself. And what I mean by that is they say these things are going to help you overcome these obstacles that, you are, that you're struggling with, especially the internal mm. turmoil. But in essence, what they want you to do is go back into the system and just be a very good soldier. Right. It's about basically going back into the very problem itself. It's not yeah. about finding a way to be outside of this problem and find a new yeah. way. It's about fitting into the problem. And I think mm -hmm. that is inherently the reason why most people who go down the rabbit hole of trying to find answers, and especially in the self-help world, go from one self-help book to the next. And, you know, they never find the answer because I don't think that's where the answer can be found. Yeah. And look, the other thing is that that's um I mean, it it targets probably the most useless and least agentic sort of um, demographic on the planet, <laughs> which is, you know, a, a very particular uh, kind of country's um, middle class, like upper middle class, um, you know, who sort of have swallowed hook, line and sinker this idea of, you know, be the change you want to see in the world with our thoughts, we make the world you know, there's been this sort of pervasive idea uh, getting around academia and, you know, in the pseudo sciences of psychology and everything else, this, this, this sort of silly idea that nothing exists outside of the text. And that if somehow, if you change the way we represent reality, then you can change the reality itself, you know? So, um, and a lot of heuristics will come in from that end. Uh, so, you know, heuristic being, um, you know, a sort of scientific way of doing the chunking, what they call that uh, humans just sort of naturally do. You know, you haven't got you haven't got time or the processing power to like <laughs> to you know uh, completely analyze all the multiple data sets that are coming in all the time through all your senses and from your relationships, you know, with the world all around you. So you invent heuristics that make things easier. They're, and they're never accurate, but they, they they do make things quicker. And, and you know, if they result in success, like more times than not, then you keep them. Uh, sometimes you keep them even if they don't. So, I mean, that could be something like, oh, there's two kinds of people, you know, Elvis people and Beatles people. <laughs> Which one are you? Ah, that guy's a freaking Beatles. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And you can uh, you you build it from there. Um, you know, and and I guess that's also the source of a lot of prejudice and bigotry as well. It's those. It's that kind of chunking. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, so I mean, you know, we we have all these heuristics uh, that result in racism, and then we have uh, heuristics for anti-racism, for example, and then and and it. Either end of the spectrum, we have people making out like bandits in grip uh, in grifts. You know these heuristics are. It's you know so you got people on, uh, and they're, they're they're just as bad as each other. You got some people who are going, you know, ah, uh, oh, it's it's the globalists, <laughs> it's the globalists, um, you know, doing all this and and you know it's the globalists have this evil agenda, you know, wokeism and they turn the frogs gay and they. When I, when I'm eating children and grooming, grooming our children, <laughs> you, you got kind of that side of things, um, you know, and then you've got the other side of thing and, and they're sort of selling that along with a lot of supplements and stuff like that. Usually <laughs> they make a lot of money. Um, there's a lot of dark money to be had too, because, you know, that agenda is uh, funded by, you know, like actual elites. <laughs> who are not progressive they're all your peter teals and coke brothers and all that kind of thing that that fund like these insane uh extreme right-wing fund uh think tanks around the planet to sort of stir up all this stuff and um basically you know make any kind of regulation almost impossible in any kind of uh state action you know <laughs> 
to prevent the worst excesses of big money um, from doing the things they're going to do. Uh, so you've got them on that end, on that grift, making a killing. And then you've got the the, the grift on the other end of, of things that's sort of given up any pretense of actually trying to stop that problem at the root as well. And, um, you know, so they deliver workshops to, uh, you know, mostly upper middle class white ladies as a general rule who just continue buying the books book after book and continue doing the work this semi-religious self-examination kind of uh self-actualization you know pro pro process that's that's religious in the sense that you're never going to be without sin you know it's it's a lifelong struggle to try and you know reach the kingdom of heaven <laughs> and you're never going to get there uh because you're always going to have that stain of sin on your soul you know uh like around things like misogyny racism you pick it you know uh there's this idea oh, well you're this group so you're inherently flawed and you're evil and there's no way you're ever going to get rid of that but you have to do the work anyway <laughs> you have to be constantly you know, looking at yourself, God forbid you should look out at the actual power structures and flows of money and influence that are, you know, causing <laughs> the bridges to be lower in this side of town and then and and all the buses on that side of the bridge are higher <laughs> because we don't want those people over here. And, uh, you know, the real estate uh, prices and manipulation and zonings that occur in different places and gentrification and vulture capitalism after disasters and etc cetera, etc cetera, all the just the endless like actual elite money and uh you know influences going around the place and um yeah i just think we we should probably have a bit more of a laugh about things and uh, as we go along yeah so you know so, as I you, mean, yeah. it, 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 do you, have you ever done like have you ever had any like uh semi-humorous conversations about your name for example Oh, of course. Man, Every time I go man. to Los Angeles. 1992. <laughs> the yeah. good old days. Yeah, yeah. You could just beat a man to death on video and yeah. then just say I didn't do it. Yeah. That's, yeah, um, yeah like, exactly. See, so you know, it's, it's, it's horrendous things and it's, it's a difference between laughing at and just laughing about unfortunate, you know, um, uh, confluences of things like that, that you're called Rodney King. Mm -hmm. And is that is it a South African accent you got there? Oh, it is. I'm, origi I'm up? Yeah, I'm originally from South Africa, but I I live on the Isle of Man. Yeah, you now what's yeah. funny about that is that that I'm allowed to tease you about your. I, there's there's not many accents in the world that you can do, and just be completely xenophobic about uh, scot free, but. Uh, I'm allowed to uh, tease you about your accent as much as I like. That's not it's bad. That's pretty good. That I can do. <laughs> And uh, never be regarded as uh, xenophobic for doing so, <laughs> just be just because of apartheid. You got, I reckon, I reckon at least a good fifty years of uh, <laughs> just <laughs> being able to get you're being teased with absolutely yeah. no no repercussions. So um, yeah, I, I would totally find that hilarious and um, and and rib you mercilessly on that because it's. It's almost part of the Geneva Convention that I'm allowed to do so. It's, uh, it's all good with which me. Is, <laughs> which is awesome. It's all good so with me. Dr. Dr. Rodney. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah, that's that's a that's a story in of itself, right? I mean, I went yeah, down yeah. the path of academia, you know, just being a, a good soldier, so to speak, a good player in the machine. Um yeah. You know, only to realize at the end of the day, coming out of all of it, that none of it really answered what I was looking for. And, you know, just yeah. based on what you were saying, Tyson, like just kind of like where you were you were talking and it's just all these different things that are vying for our yeah. attention and, and so forth. It reminded me of a, of a quote that I think is really pertinent to what we are talking about. Um, a, a quote by who now sadly has passed away, Thich Nhat Han. He had this quote that just really stuck with me. Um, this is the quote. We have constructed a system we can't control. It imposes mm. itself on us and we become its slaves and victims. We have created a society in which the rich become richer and the poor become poorer and in which we are so caught up in our own immediate problems that we cannot afford to be aware of what is going on in the rest of the human family or our planet mm. Earth. 
In, oh, yeah. my, in my mind, I see, a, and this is important because this speaks to what you just said. In my mind, I see a group of chickens in a cage disputing over a few seeds of grain, unaware that in a few hours they will all be killed. Mm. That's it. That's it. And But then people ruin that as well. So you got some people who, you know, when they have to address something in the moment, which is something horrendous that they're doing and doing over and over that's um, really causing people pain, you know, they'll dismiss that and sort of go, hey, there's bigger problems in the world. <laughs> you know, um, I, I I can deny you access to this place because of because you have to walk with sticks or whatever. But uh, and, you know, oh, yeah, that's bad. But, you know, climate change, bro. You know, <laughs> just you just uh, you just gonna have to deal with it. Like, uh, I mean, why are you focusing on this tiny problem? Uh, you know, I, I I don't have to be accountable for this because, geez, there's bigger problems in the world. Um, so you got people who will use that as a kind of cognitive and, and ethical bypass as well. Sure, but it's freaking true. It's true as well. And, and I think um, a lot of people have the time and resources and leisure to become consumed uh, completely in endless rounds of, of, of just sort of weird struggle sessions, you know. Um, yeah, it's a, what do they call it with chickens? A pecking party. Hmm. Yeah, you heard that analogy too. Sure. You know, there'll be a, like a speck on one of the chickens, so another chick will peck at it for a bit and then it bleeds a little and so then there's that spot of blood and the other chickens start picking and in 10 minutes that that chooks just ripped apart yeah anybody who has chooks it's uh <laughs> will will know <laughs> they're, they're freaking dinosaurs man they're um horrendous <laughs> like uh yeah raptors <laughs> just <laughs> man i had a rooster once who was so violent i had to lock him outside from all the other uh, chickens and I had to lock them all in and I like to free range them, but I had to lock them up because he was just stalking them and killing them um, before I could get to him because he kept running off into the bush. Anyway, he, um, I came along and, and, and a couple of the chickens were reaching their heads out uh, through the wire to get to some of the green grass on the outside and he just ripped their heads right off. So yeah, I come down, I see like three hens, just their bodies up against the wire and their heads like five meters away. And it's like, yeah, that's uh that's what that's what chickens do. So I think it's an appropriate it's an appropriate metaphor. Um yeah. And I don't know. We uh I think we're all we're always gonna be owned and someone's gonna be collecting our eggs. Someone's gonna be eating us. It's, uh, it's so probably, do you, probably yeah. nicer to be on a free free range farm than I guess. Yeah, <laughs> that's other. my that's my question, right? So I guess. Yeah. Well, from, and they would tell us, well, isn't it better? Isn't it better to be in a cage than out with the foxes? Uh, oh, there's foxes out there. There's snakes. There's hawks. Um, you know, we're we're protecting you. <laughs> Yeah, we're protecting you under the guise of actually just wanting you mm. to conform and yeah. be a good player in the system and the machine. So I guess but then, then once yeah. again, anybody who's ever had a broken leg and, and been raising chickens, you know, and and you can't really do what you need to do for them for a couple of months. You, so you just open a door and you can't feed them. <laughs> you just let them go. You come back in a couple of months and they're different, different birds. Mm. Yeah, there's only half of them left, but that half is sticking around. They they figured stuff out. Um, you know, you go down at sunset and they're all they're flying. It's like I didn't know chickens could fly. Yeah, they could fly. <laughs> they're flying right up to the top of the tree. <laughs> so, but you that's know, based where, on where based, sleep. yeah, based mm. on your analogy, what you've inherently done is you've allowed them to find their innate wildness. Yeah, yeah. So isn't that really what the problem is, is that we've lost our wildness, that we've become domesticated, and that's the crux of most of the problems that we find ourselves having to deal with? Yeah, I, I just, I don't know if, I don't know many people who prefer to be a chicken than a, than a pheasant, you know? You, you see those pheasants, and they, they do pretty well. <laughs> they're pretty uh, they're pretty tricksy, and they dodge the foxes fairly well. And they're kind of beautiful, too. Sure. They're a hell of a lot more attractive, um, the meat's a bit tougher and gamier, but um, but I know who I'd rather be. 
But I think that's what everybody, even if they don't acknowledge it as such, right? Even if it's an unconscious kind of desire, that's what they are seeking. And I guess what I'm trying to do for myself, of course, and of course, through these discussions is find, are there are there ways to do it? I mean, I guess, yeah. you know, let's take, for example, I mean, I don't know what your take is on this, but mm. let's just make an assumption that at some, I mean, this is how I, I view it. Every single person on this planet, if they want to agree to it or not, at some point mm. in their ancestry, they all came from hunter gatherers. We all yeah. came from a time from the same place. That is my, my DNA, right? That is my historical mm. DNA. And that is a time that we could potentially argue that where we were allowed to be wild. And I think that when you look at people and look at what they trying to do, even if it's misguided and it's wrong and it's, it's, it's causing even more problems. I mean, inherently Mm. what they're seeking is that return to wildness, but now we are stuck in this, like, like I said earlier, you know, does a fish know that it's in water? We stuck in the sea that is the system that Mm. unless we stand outside of it, we don't know that we're in it. Yeah, oh, we have that impulse. All of us have that impulse to become human again, you know. Um, so I even go further and yeah, say... Yeah, to yeah, become human. really... Yeah, we're, we're feeling it. It's not just an impulse. It's like a an alarm going off, yeah. you know, at the genetic level. It's, it's exactly. just a constant stressing frustration signal genetically going through all of our bodies. And so we seek, you know, we go out and seek and, and what do we find? You know, we find the grift. We find the grift from, you know, my side of things of, you know, there's, oh, there's ancient wisdom, you know, there's ancient wisdom from indigenous people, you know, some native, you know, philosophies and stuff like that, that we can, that we can take on board. And, you know, someone's peddling that and, and then someone's peddling paleo stuff and there's, you know, someone's promoting a lion diet or a high protein diet, and, you know, and, um and, and kind of a, a return to, you know, uh, you know, Neolithic gender roles and, and different kinds of stuff and like using, you know, uh, evolutionary psychology, you know, looking at our, our primitive ancestry and why we're like this and how to return to that. And, you know, and that just has the really unfortunate effect of, of turning an entire generation of young men into that rooster I was describing before who was prowling around outside the hutch, like ripping their heads off chooks, off the hens, you know. Um, that's not a desirable state of returning to wildness either. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that rooster thought he was the business. Um, I'm bigger and stronger than all the other chickens and I can even beat up a fox. Uh, <laughs> I'm wild again. I'm wild again. It's like, well, go away then. <laughs> Gentlemen. Yeah. Well, yes, my, Frank. Hey. My apologies. Yeah, no problem, Frank. I, I mean, all the be here. Yeah. Yeah, no uh, problem. <laughs> Hey, exuberant Glad to animal. Be here. Yeah, Glad to be here. yeah, yeah. So, so anyway, we we're talking about all the things we we've been talking about, Frank. Don't worry. And uh, Tyson, I, I don't know if you. I've only heard a few humorous. words. <laughs> I've only heard a few words from Frank, but his voice is reminding me. I'm thinking of Silence of the Lambs. <laughs> Can you just say for me, put the lotion in the basket. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, oh boy! So what? Bring me up to date. What are we? Uh, what, well, are we, we haven't. We still. We still. Yeah. Still digging in. We're still trying to. We're figure just talking out about the pitfalls. Stuff. The pitfalls of rewilding and all the grifts that are out there. The grifts yeah. that are out there from people's different, uh, you know, um, uh, political ties and ideologies and uh, their funding sources and all these sorts of things that. Um, and you know the 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 ideologies that they sell, you know, around regen, rewilding, um, you know, anarcho primitivism, all, all these kinds of uh, all these kinds of grifts on the left and the right that people do uh, under this kind of developmental self help, you know, um, self help thing informed by you know misunderstandings around. Uh, evolutionary psychology, et cetera, et cetera. So not much, but that's where we started. But mostly talking about chickens. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> but Tyson, here's my question, right? I mean, I, I, I totally acknowledge what you're saying. Is there no point then in trying? Because like if somebody's listening to what you're saying, right? I mean, I think we can all acknowledge that there, everything gets 
taken out of context or gets used for nefarious means, as you said, right? Like, let's take evolutionary psychology, giving people then permission to be that rooster that you described, which is yeah. like, you, like you noted, is obviously not an optimal state. So, is there no worth in worth in trying? Ah, oh, no, no, no. But there is there is worth in being discerning. Sure. And being Absolutely. aware of grifts and being aware of, yeah. you know, uh, where the answers lie. And what's um what's interesting is it's in the place where places where most people aren't looking. You know, it's it's in their um it's in their relationships and 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 in their just general human patterning. And that's yes, to an extent, it's in your in your DNA, in your, you know, hardwired you know, basically just the machinery that's running all the time that's that's getting you to act in certain ways and respond mm. in certain ways and, you know, stripping back your your training, you know, of a lifetime to uh, allow yourself to react in those ways. But that's that's the smaller part of it. Mm. You know, self-help is not the way. Um, it, it's about attending to your relationships, you know, because the answers are in, in the web of relations that is really you. Yeah, because most yeah. of most of what makes up you, even your cognition, is actually existing beyond yourself in those relationships, um, and particularly paying attention to those moments when, when the um, the controls of the state and of the economy, the marketplace, when these are temporarily disrupted, um, and th this can happen for you in your life in things like, uh, like I don't know, you know, when you're at a wedding. And at about about eleven thirty at night, and and just everybody's really carried away with the celebration. It could be anything, a party, and it feels like that's the world now. Mm. Um, and the rest of the world doesn't exist, and no one's thinking about money, no one's thinking about anything. And that, I mean, that's a that's a that's a positive example. But also when there's a natural disaster or something, and you know the the power's out, and all the shops are closed, and you're coming out of your house and meeting your neighbors <laughs> and um you know there, there's a kind of solidarity and a, and a relatedness a relationality that that just comes out then and people find that there's an abundance in the scarcity if they're sharing and helping each other out mm -hmm. you know all that mutual aid activism is grounded in that uh you know coming out of that uh, the anarcho-communism of the, the early 1900s that that brief <laughs> little flower that bloomed there, you know. Um, but but that's people find their their human patterning. Then people find uh, you know like a an animal is born in captivity, but then is released and somehow knows the migration routes. Like a, a whale that's released in into the ocean, it was born in a tank, and it knows with migration routes. It knows where to hook up with the other whales, you know. That's just kind of inherently in us, this human patterning of of uh, looking after each other and growing and knowing together what it is that you're supposed to do. Mm. Because then uh, demotically, you know, as a group that emerges, we, you start to come into place and the land speaks to you and through you and you speak from that and you act from that and you notice the flowers and the things that go on at the same time and and then you know what's medicinal you know, in the right combinations at the right time. And, you know, you start to come back into the land. You come back into a right understanding and that the land gives you all those patterns around you, the appropriate governance models for that place, the appropriate economies and, you know, um, all the regenerative patternings of culture and language and everything else that 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 you need to just relearn and redevelop with each other. But that are constantly changing too, because the land changes, mm. and you move with the land, you move with the context, you adapt over time. So you know this idea of uh, people keep saying, like the first thing people will say is, you know, oh, you Hobbes or Rousseau, you know, you can't go back, you can't go back, you know, oh, what are you talking about, bloody, you know, indigenous ways for, or, or you know, our, our ancestors, we can't go back to that way of life, you can't go backwards. It's like no, but you can retrieve things forwards, and you can um, you can particularly take on that process of of adaptation uh, that all of our ancestors had until even just a century ago. You know, your great grandparents, if you remember talking to them when you were a kid, they they lived on the land, 
you know, your great grandparents lived on the land, even if they were in the city, they would have had pigs and chickens in their backyard. You know what I mean? Uh, most of the people on the planet were well, like that. Yeah, and yeah. It, until a century ago, there weren't any great nations. You know, there was more regional identities. Mm. And, um, you know, it's it's not like we're irretrievably lost, that it's been so many generations that now we're just these, like, you know, weird, weird uh, domesticated you know, facile sort of pigs just floating around in our own shit for the rest of our lives. But, you know, you what you just said now answers some of what I was kind of trying to get to. When you, the way you were talking to me, that speaks to our innate wildness. And when we, mm. you referenced it a few times, but when we talk about, you know, people wanting to bring into the present indigenous mm. knowledge, is it not the case that, we have forgotten because at some point, as I said earlier, somewhere down my history and my lineage, as you also kind of alluded to, that indigenous knowledge was the knowledge of all of us. It mm. was part and parcel of all of our experiences or at least our ancestors. And we now, have, for many in the West, of course, have forgotten what that is. And because we have this innate desire to find our wildness, that's the reason why these things are coming to the forefront. Now, not always in the way that we would like them to be. And unfortunately, mm. oftentimes, and, and you've, you've said this too, have become part of the problem, become part of the system. You know, yeah. it's, it becomes a money-making kind of exercise more than it actually mm. is about health. But we all inherently, I think, if we allow ourselves to open to that, have that, that doorway to what is typically defined as, and maybe not the way, right way to describe it, indigenous ways of knowing and being. Because what mm. you just described now would have been our natural state in mm. community with other people, with a group where we cared, where we lived off the land, where we felt the land, where we were part of it, where we saw the signs, as you noted. All of these yeah. things are our innate wisdom and for most of human history, that is where we were. This modern interpretation is just a, a momentary time on the, 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 the lineage of the human animal experience. Mm. Mm. Well, I think that, you know, I mean, another big nail in the coffin was the enclosure of the, of the commons. Right. You know, that's it. I mean, and. And obviously, you probably got like ten episodes on that anyway, and you know, <laughs> preaching to the choir. And <laughs> no, but I mean, the thing is, the people you know, listening to this um, might never have heard that, Tyson. So it's yeah, well, it's, I mean, it's it's explore. important if 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 anybody listening hasn't had come across the concept of the commons and commenting, and uh, the enclosure of the commons that occurred, you know, relatively recently in history, that was um, that was part of that process of of dehumanizing uh, people as groups and and you know, removing people from the landscape. I mean, there was the restructuring of the family um, uh, that occurred at, uh, under the Catholic Church uh, back in the day. This, this wasn't very long ago. But when the family started to become um, uh, restructured and, and sort of holy law was starting to determine who you could marry and who you couldn't, um, and that was sort of breaking, breaking down extended families, breaking up extended families, breaking up villages and communities of people who were tending to commons, and um, making a family structure and an economic structure that was more and and economic, um, you know, financial law that was more based on the individual in order for the uh, the church to uh, be able to extract wealth from individuals. You you can't extract wealth very easily you know, from a large extended family who communally owns that wealth. Yeah. <laughs> so you saw that restructuring. And then, of course, you saw uh, monarchs engaging in the enclosure of the commons, which meant, you know, that that all of the villages and the, the people who were tending to commons, including meadows, um, yeah, forests, et cetera, area, areas in England, which was a large part of people's subsistence and um, yeah. and just the health of, of the land base, you know, in those places. Um, when, when you saw that happening and the queen suddenly owed, owned every single swan in the empire, <laughs> we got black swans in Australia. I, I don't know if she claimed those as well, but, um, yeah, there was certainly some black swans that turned around and bit her in the ass in the end. Um, although figurative black swans, <laughs> I guess, because they're always coming. Um, 
yeah, I guess that's another thing for people to look up is that that black swan. <laughs> black oh, that's swan some, that, yeah, that's like some really good about in the space. But the comments, yeah, the comments is really important. That was a that was a huge uh, that was a huge moment. Yeah, Frank, you got something uh, you want to say? Big nail in the coffin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I read a, a Middle Earth fantasy series called The Eye of the World by Robert Jordan, and it's this epic saga of Middle Earth and that kind of thing. And one theme that runs through the mythology of that whole culture is this idea of the breaking of the world. And that just resonated with me. And ever since then, I've tried to come up with a list of things that we might point to as the breaking of the world. And I bet you have something to say about that. Well, yeah. And and that's why it's such a good story. So I've read a bit, little bit of his stuff, um, I, admittedly, you know, uh, decades ago. <laughs> but, um, yeah, but the, I mean, that whole genre, you have to have a broken a broken world in order for competitive dynamics and zero sum games to be able to operate at all, because that is intensely unnatural state of affairs, you know, for people to be in competition rather than, you know, uh, being limited by the maximum power principle and things like this, where, you know, you can't in increase in power and stature without, you know, there, there are limits in the systems around you that prevent you from turning into a cancerous cell, for example, you know? Um, yeah, the, the world must be broken in order for that cancer to spread that cancer of competitive rivalrous dynamics. And, um, arguably it's hard to have a good story without it. <laughs> you have to be talking right. about a world that's profoundly right. broken in order to keep someone turning that page because the hero's journey is only the hero's journey. If there are villains and, and, you know, and if that uh, hero must vanquish a lot of people in order to come out on top of the pyramid, you know, um, it's a pretty boring story if it's, you know, right. if we're right. just, uh, this is us just uniting together, uh, doing regenerative wisdom every day to, to maintain a, uh, you know, a stable and adaptive uh, population in, in relation with nature for the next 10,000 years. It's, that's a pretty freaking boring story. Who's the hero there? Well, the hero is um, is the land base. And uh, let's ask her what she's got to say about it. Land base, any comments? Are you going to do something? Or no, not for a while. Maybe a volcano in a thousand years. Well, we'll we'll we'll, we'll get back to that. <laughs> that story it takes a long time. No one's going to read that. That's no fun. I want some excitement in my life. I want heroes. I want winners and losers. I want to stomp on some heads. It's uh, you know, <laughs> it's very alluring, isn't it? That's why I like Viking stories more than I like my own culture stories. I, I mean, I love my culture stories and it's the right way and it has the law, but um, they can be pretty boring in, in comparison with some Icelandic dude running around with an axe, killing trolls and that. That's, that's what I want to see. Yeah, <laughs> I want to see Middle Earth sundered. Everybody at each other's throats. Dog eat dog. Let's do this thing. <laughs> Wow. Well, you know, I've been to some of these uh, paleo conferences and it's really fascinating to me because the focus has always been on food and sort of cherry picking a few indigenous ideas at best. And that's it. And it's all about building super high performance athletes. And so it's all narcissistic. Yeah. And and, yeah. it just, and it just drives me crazy because they're they're missing the bigger picture completely. Yeah. I, I don't they sell a lot of stuff, you know, they sell a lot yeah. of supplements, a lot of food, grass fed this, whatever. Yeah. And it, it uh I'm going, because you, then nobody wants to be a hobbit. Who wants to be a hobbit? <laughs> it's like, absolutely perfect life. You really want to be that, but that's not your avatar. You want to be like, yes, I am the barbarian on the tundra surviving in the harsh environment and chasing down the mammoth. I killed five mammoths single-handed. Just me with my axe. Blah. You know, that's who you want to be. No one want to be the Hobbit. But secretly, everybody does want to be the Hobbit. That's the thing, right? I was just thinking that as you were saying that, Tyson, I mean, isn't, isn't that inherently that's what we do want? 
So I guess what is that drive? What is that need to always want to be that that Viking, right? I mean, like I say mm. to Frank all the time, like one of the things that I hated was when men described the, themselves as alpha males. I'm like, what does that mm. actually mean? What do you mean <laughs> by that? <laughs> yeah. Oh, but that that's a whole other grift. That's an entire other grift. And I, I alluded to that briefly before. Mm. Mm. Um, mm. But that's a, that's a really big grift. And, and they do rely on a lot of cherry pick bullshit from evolutionary psychology and you know assumptions about the story of our our ancient past and you know the patriarchy is somehow a, a natural thing in nature from lobsters to everything else you know and it's just it's a horrendous grift um that is so awfully damaging to so many young men and and results in you know worse than just incels and 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 um you know, those kinds of things in the pickup artistry schools and Gamergate and all that kind of thing. It, it gets worse. You know, it ends in, you know, the Proud Boys and a whole heap of brown shirts, basically. But modern brown shirts, I don't call them brown shirts, I call them brown shorts. It's, I think they're mostly scared little boys that briefly just come out of their mum's basement. You know, I, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm a 50-year-old man. I'm really out of shape, but I reckon I could take out at least eight Proud Boys. <laughs> uh, without breaking a sweat they 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 they're no good but um yeah no it's a it's a horrendous movement but these these people are used are used you know by the same forces i was talking about before and you know basically are corralled by people like you know roger stone you know, in the united states there on your island there uh, exuberant animal <laughs> um yeah the 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 they're just uh, they're they're manipulated and used. To, they're held there as sort of shock troops to have that constant threat of violence uh, that's there of political violence. Uh, they're basically a standing army, you know, uh, you know, stand back and stand by kind of thing. Um, yeah. You know that, and, and you know that uh, we can just you know shock, jock, dog, whistle these fellas in whenever uh, you know anyone gets on top of things if. You try to stop us from burning all these books on bloody, you know, um, blockading the library where, you know, some fellow in a dress wants to read a book to some kids. <laughs> you know, it's just a, <laughs> ah, it's, it's, it, it is deeply upsetting, but that's where it, that's where it goes. And so that's why I, I keep saying, you know, you got to be aware of the grifts because mm. those, those grifters there, a lot of, oftentimes they'll really believe in what they're doing and they might be doing it, doing positive things and actually helping people, uh, you know, pick themselves up in their lives and they might have some truth in what they're saying. Um, but they're also part of an ecosystem. You know, there are, there's audience capture going on there. There's dark funding going on there and the whole message is being manipulated, you know, mm -hmm. within some pretty intense algorithms that are funneling people towards some unpleasant things. Yeah. And nobody wants to be the wolf that's getting bit. Everybody wants to be the alpha male. Uh, although they should probably read the actual studies about pack behavior and, and the intergenerational authority that goes on there, which is much closer to actual human, <laughs> um, you know, authority. Authority is different from power, by the way. You know, um, you know it's not uh, bossing people. You know, so authority in a wolf pack is you know, about intergenerational relations that, um, you know, have respect for um, for experience. <laughs> it's not about who can bite the hardest. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I see, I see some of this in my other work because what I'm pretty much noted for outside of, you know, the other things I do is, is I teach martial arts and that's what I've been doing since I was 16 years old. Nice. And yeah, I, you know, I've, I've been very fortunate to be able to teach all over the world, but I, most of the people that come to me are, are men and I mm -hmm. get to see things on the mat with them that they don't see themselves. And mm -hmm. everything you, you're speaking about speaks to that, you mm -hmm. know, this, it's kind of odd really too, you know, just as a side point to that is that one of the things I've always noted was that I find it fascinating that in some of the most safest parts of the world, where crime is not insidious as it is in other parts of the world. I mean, literally, you can walk down the street and everything's going to be okay. Norway, Sweden, Denmark, these kinds of countries have the most amount of people training martial arts, mainly men, 
for a mm. skill set that they're probably never ever going to use, right? That not at yeah. least from a survival standpoint. So you have to ask yourself, what is this kind of need to engage in that mm. kind of experience? Because mm. you know, they 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 you oftentimes when you sit down, this kind of all this bravado and all this kind of alpha maleness that they want to yeah. either capture or exhibit speaks to deep insecurities. Uh it's it's just also immensely satisfying you know i i mean i like to think i don't have a lot of deep insecurities like that but i am you know when i do do martial arts i i'm infinitely bored by someone who's trying to balance my chi you know um <laughs> which is really good for me and i'd be a lot healthier now and have a better life if i did that but i don't want to do that i want to i want to like I want to tussle with someone who is going to try and bite my ear on the mat and, and is going to be shouting homophobic slurs at me and, 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 and teaching me how to break someone's knee. You know, that's. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I get, I get, I get. Your I, point. I, just, I find that so much more entertaining and it yeah. just comes back to what I said before. It's we've got to be able to laugh at these things. Sure, of course, but the of course. fact is the evil stuff, the self-serving, you know, stuff is, is so much more entertaining and so much more satisfying. And we need to, we need to be able to like lean into that a little so that we can, you know, identify, you know, that the, uh, our, our enemy is, is getting more eyeballs than us. Our enemy is getting more interest than us because our enemy has good, uh, has an entertaining story. Our enemy has an attractive narrative that you can't look away from. Um, our enemy is exciting. Um, the people who are destroying the world are freaking exciting. Everybody loves e Elon. You know, <laughs> everyone loves Elon. And even if they don't like him, they're still freaking watching, you know. And it, it doesn't matter what horrendous thing he does. In fact, the more horrendous, the better. Everyone watches more. Everyone talks about him more. Mm -hmm. There are big things happening in the world at the moment. And, um, but most people are talking about Elon and Twitter. <laughs> yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Um, so the latest figures are that something like 1 billion people on the planet suffer from some kind of mental illness. Yeah. So that's like one out of eight. Yeah. And what do you have to say about that? Um, I, ju I just say that the... The, the other 7 billion are just uh, high functioning. <laughs> I think, you know, I think look, most it, of the people yeah. on the planet right now are in, are, you know, are in deep shit psychologically. And if, yeah. if you're feeling comfortable, then, then, you know, you've got a suite of mental illnesses that is just serving, you know, the, the economic context that you're in. Mm -hmm. yeah, and uh, so, the, so they're not appearing as pathologies. Usually a pathologies appear as pathologies when they come up hard against the economic system and the behaviors that are required for it, mm. um, for you to fit into that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and what is described as mental health is just a, it's just a suite of illnesses that is, um, that is more conducive to, you know, uh, doing what you're supposed to be doing. <laughs> and, and it's also the ones that we've just categorized, right? So like you said, yeah. I mean, there, there are a bunch of other st stuff going on that maybe won't show up on those statistics, right? So when yeah. they're saying, you know, one in eight, I would argue it's closer probably to mm. eight in eight. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, I don't believe that because as I'm looking around, yeah. there's a bunch of stuff going on and they just haven't caught up to it yet. And as you know, exactly. So you know, at what's and that's it. That's everyone in the world. There's no yeah. like perfect, you know, sure. everybody has this romantic idea about indigenous people. So what about right in the middle of the Amazon when never, never seen a, a an airplane even before, you know, people have never had contact with the outside world, you know, Do, are they mentally ill too? Hell yes, they are. You know, there's suddenly there's no fish in the, the fish numbers are down in the river. There's, there's things that are going on there that are, you know, really severely interrupting their, uh, their their ways of life. The flows in the jungle have changed. You know, uh, things aren't moving around and migrating the same way. They're also, um, you know, because of the destruction of a lot of those populations and territories, their economic system of trade, you know, between all the different groups that actually made sure that everybody had what everybody needed mm. for tens of thousands of years, that's, 
that's changed as well. That's been disrupted. So now you got people in scarcity mentality, and you got you know different tribes that are at war with each other for the last bloody century or two. Um, since all that got disrupted. And, you know, so they're not sleeping very well at night because they don't know when another tribe's going to come in with machetes or bloody spears or whatever, you know. Um, and, you know, so they're really struggling. And then one day the river changes colour and you don't know why and the fish are all gone. And um, it's like, oh, goodness me, they, you know, this tribe wandered into civilization. They they wandered out of the jungle to join civilization. You know, they finally gave up on that. <laughs> their primitivist experiment rejoin the humans <laughs> that's like well we couldn't live anymore in there because everything's dying what do you mean this pristine jungle <laughs> looks amazing to me yeah there's freaking trees everywhere what do you mean you couldn't survive in there <laughs> everything's dying bros <laughs> everything's dying <laughs> you know there isn't anybody anywhere who isn't like horrendously traumatized by the massive changes in, in the dying world around us. And each one of us is feeling that like just a, a dagger through the heart, like 10 times a day. Um, yeah. Some of us just have mental illnesses resulting from that, that, um, that are conducive to being a good employee and they're regarded as people who are mentally healthy and well adjusted. <laughs> yeah. But just based on what you were saying there, Tyson, one of our previous guests that we spoke to, um, Layla Abdel Rahim, she was talking about, you know, just the whole idea of, you know, looking to our closest relatives, you know, if, if you follow that line, right, uh, talking about, you know, chimpanzees as an example, and the inherent violence that we now know that they engage in. But mm. the argument that most people seem to forget is that exactly what you just said is that we say they're living in the wild and they're exhibiting these behaviors, but it's not actually the wild. I mean, it's not the wild yeah. wild. It's, it's a, it's a fenced off part that's being yeah. designated as wild with all yeah. of humanity encroaching on it and changing the, like you said, the entire ecosystem. And then we yeah. wonder why we see these aberrant behaviors. And so yeah. we could make that same argument for human beings, right? Is that we're living in this civilized world, supposedly in inverted commas, but actually mm. it's one big giant cage, and we're exhibiting all the behaviors that we typically would see of wild animals in the zoo, which we have a name yeah. for, zoocosis. If you look at an animal and what oh, they nice. do, a wild animal in a, a zoocosis kind of environment, you know, where they're mm. exhibiting these horrendous behaviors, you know, self-mutilating themselves, over-grooming, pacing, and so stable forth. Stable vices. They, they call some of those things stable vices. Yeah. Uh, right. Yeah, yeah. That's, you, that's humans. Look around. <laughs> That's what I see. It's back to <laughs> yeah. Thichnod Han and about the chickens, right? <laughs> about pecking, you know, a few seeds, fighting over a few seeds, only to not even realize that in a few hours, they're all going to be killed and be dinner. Yeah. So as we come so, to, yeah, so as we come to the end well, of this, I, I, Tyson, I still don't yeah. want my cousin to give more seeds than me. <laughs> <laughs> I got fried up. Well, he's no good. He's, he's fat already. <laughs> hey. Yeah, but he's Tyson, like, as, as we- been as rude we, to me. As been hogging the TV, I don't know. Yeah. fight my cousin for them seeds. It's um, it, it's a hell of a bind. Like you know, we, it's good to name these problems, but then you know, finding the way out from them is like uh, we need to keep having this conversation, even though sure. you know it's it's kind of getting old now. You know, it's it's getting old for a lot of people. It's um, it's like well, you know, keep talking, uh, keep struggling, and and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> try to do something um but your action shouldn't be within the model that's prescribed everybody's got a startup everybody's got a freaking regen startup at the moment and it's frustrating me i get like 20 bloody emails a week people want me to endorse their regen startup and it's like jesus how many of these things you know everyone wants to be have the startup and the one that's going to beat all the other startups and, and become the facebook or regen and it's like that's not how it works mm -hmm. people still want to be the ceo people still want to have economic success but by doing some kind of impacting investing bloody networking bloody something or other that they've figured out ah you know um so that's another, I reckon that's another grift, but it's unintentional. 
that one. We've got to watch out for this one. Um, and we've got to keep having these yarns and we've got to keep checking ourselves. And that's why I said sense of humor is the most important thing. And that's the thing that's lacking. You, you've got to be able to laugh at yourself and you've got to be able to have your friends around you laughing at your foibles as well. Sure. Uh, Cause that's really the only way that you can keep an eye on yourself and do that self critique, but then also do, do, you know, police the behaviors in your group in a way that's non-threatening and fun. We all, we all got to be able to laugh at ourselves. Um, yeah, it's really funny. Um, I laughed so hard the other day. There's, there was a friend of ours who's from a particular ethnicity and, um, and she, she has an anglicized name because she says Australians can't pronounce my name, you know, but her name's quite pronounceable. Um, and I, I went off on this tirade about like, you know, how ridiculous people are, and, you know, uh, you're just so completely blind to other cultures that you can't even say a simple name that's not familiar to you, you know, and I went off on that for like 10 minutes. Anyway, uh, later in the day, I like referred to this person, <laughs> but I, I said their name, which sounded like a, uh, a, a, a famous uh, dish, <laughs> food dish from that culture. <laughs> and I said that. <laughs> it was, and we all just pissed ourselves laughing because it was just the hypocrisy of of me of me like you know sallying forth about this this you know um, this xenophobia <laughs> like just a couple of hours earlier and then there I am you know um, making this ridiculous anyway it was the most ridiculously ignorant thing I've ever said and I must have laughed for a good hour and a half about that we we all had a good laugh about it people are still teasing me about it. <laughs> And, and I think that's a beautiful way to go forward. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think it's a it's a good way for us to end the conversation, Tyson, because I want to be respectful of your time. I think it was, it was, yeah, yeah. It was pretty cool, man. Awesome. I, I got a lot out of it. And uh, no worries. Love to keep connected with you. And uh, yeah, keep keep uh, keep the humor sure. going. Really good to talk to you, Dr. Rodney. <laughs> good South African accent, man. You're getting there. A little, little bit more watching Blood Diamonds and you'll make it. No, I, I want it to be bad. I don't want it, <laughs> to, want it to be too bad. good. All right, I okay, want it to be it. really bad and like to do it badly and like nobody can do anything about it because because apartheid. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Thanks, Tyson. Much hey, appreciated, uh, brother. All right. All right. Cool, man. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Good, good meeting you both. Cheers. Right. Okay, bye. Sure. Yeah, cool. He's fantastic. Yeah, yeah man, he's, it's 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 cool, right? I guess you have to like kind of wade through the 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 humor, <laughs> and uh, it's not really being serious at times. But then yeah, yeah, yeah. at other other moments, there are these really great nuggets, right? Like really cool things that he says, and and in a way, I mean, I've, I've come out of that chatting to him just. I don't know if that's a good thing, but definitely reaffirming in some way that what we've been talking about is the the issue that is currently underway. I guess, you know, for me, like when I when I listen to people and they talk, my um if it, if it, I don't know if it's a failing point, but my failing points would be I don't know enough like about politics and stuff like that. And it's just because I've just never, ever bothered with it. Like I, I just right. never felt the need to even know anything about it because I've never, ever once ever seen in any time where any of it has really led to something that I felt that was, you know, fundamentally inherently good for human, for the human <laughs> animal. Yeah, yeah. What I my opinion on that is there are some good people in that system, but they're hard to find. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I watched one of his videos and I I struggled a little bit because he was talking about a lot about postmodernism and mm. feminist theory and some stuff I didn't know anything about either. So, but yeah, he gives these great nuggets every now and then. Yeah, so it's cool, man. No, no, so that was good. Um, I'm happy with that. And uh yeah, we'll just we'll just keep having the conversations. I mean, that's all we can do, right? And as yeah. as as each conversation goes by, I my my kind of thinking around certain areas are getting clearer. 
some of them are going, what? I need to know more about this. I need to find out more about this. Um, But then again, to what end, right? I mean, I keep thinking that too, is that, you know, I said this before, is that I find that we are in two places all the time. It's either totally overcomplicated and it's hard to make sense of what's going on, or things are so siloed, you know, they're so independent from each other that you can't make the connection. And I still come back to this, this idea of how do we kind of simplify this? How do we get to a, to a, to a baseline where we can mm-hmm. just all, or at least for myself, that's what I want, where I can move within the world that I'm in from that baseline. And then where I need to make sense or, you know, figure things out, I can, but I've got a very good foundation to do that from. And in, in, in a sense, Tyson said it, right, is that you cannot do it within the system. I mean, that's essentially what he was saying. You need to be outside the system, which is an analogy I used when I was talking to him. I said, you know, does a fish know that it's in water? It doesn't, right? But the only way the fish is going to know that it was ever in the water was if you take the fish out of the water and it's looking back on it, right? And so in that sense, that's kind of what I feel we have to do is that we have to, as best as each one of us can within the framework that allows us to step outside the status quo and look back in and say, okay, I'm looking back in, I'm outside the status quo. This is where I am. What can I do now to simplify everything for myself? The way that I think, the way that I show up, the way that I behave, the things that I say, just so there, there is efficiency. And then when I walk back in, can I stay with that? Can I, can I keep there without having to find myself being pulled apart, literally in a multitude of different directions? Because if you look across the, the board right now, just globally, right? Everybody's fighting about everything. I mean, it's from the so from the, the the smallest things to the biggest things, and I mean, everything's a fight, and everything's a, a misunderstanding, and everybody's not agreeing with everybody else, and you know we've got all this kind of partisan aspects going on, and it's just you, there's no way that you can find your way through that, right? If you're gonna, right. or you or you can, I guess you can just align yourself to one side, but then you miss everything else, right? And so. I keep thinking there has to be a more fundamental starting point. And, you know, I was writing something today. I was thinking about this idea too, is this, this idea, especially in spiritual traditions about destroying the illusion, right? The illusion of self. But I was thinking, but even that in of itself is an illusion because self exists. I, I exist. Frank exists. Tyson exists. You, we can play it any way you want to, but we know that these things, we are having these conversations and as somebody that exists and I am here for whatever the reason is, and we can, that can be anybody's take on that. Right. But I am. And what am I going to do while I'm here? How do I show up? That's really what it comes down to for me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I've got one slide in my slideshow. I don't think I've uh, shown it to you yet but it's mm. that uh, it's about the butterfly effect and how you know we're dealing with these infinitely complex systems no matter what you're trying to do in the world and the outcomes of your behavior are totally unpredictable you you just don't know how you're affecting the world downstream mm. so the only thing you really do have control over is how you show up and that's the that's the spiritual discipline. You know, you don't know what's going to happen, so you show up with integrity. You show up with dignity, and that's the starting place, at least for me. You know? Yeah, sounds yeah. good, man. I like yeah. it. I like yeah. it. All right, cool, man. All right, Frank, we are done for this one, and then we'll we'll uh, keep uh, pushing forward, man. Hey, Dr. King here. Thank you for joining myself and Frank on an exploration in improving the health of the human animal. To find out more about our work, you can visit frank at exuberantanimal.com. For coaching with me and to find out more about the Human Animal Project, as well as our retreats, go to humananimal.info. Until the next time, be wild, be free.